I, am in, I have a place in the world. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, of, of that uh, here in the aftermath of uh, my being relieved of my various obsessions, or at least the most overt of them. Uh, we feel ourselves separate from and uh, other than. And uh, even with this bridge that's been offered to us, we conceive these scenarios, you know, where we are victimized. Uh, and what would I write if I didn't write that? That's what they're buying. Well, that's what they're buying because that's what we're selling. Um, which is to say, you know, there's, there's plenty of complicity to go around. But what other stories are there? What other series are there? Um, how many are, are parents here? So uh, you know you have been blessed uh, with the experience of the absolute refutation of your sense of solitude. You know beyond questioning, beyond thought, that our sense of ourselves as isolated, I'll do that again for ten dollars, uh, is an illusion. It's the way that we can understand the world which is congenial to us. There's me and there's them. Except If, well, let, let's talk about, well, I was talking to, uh, to this young lady, uh, we were talking about our dogs. She's got a dog named Dickens. So I say to Dickens, what's your favorite novel? And he says, Little Dorrit. I say, Bleak House. Uh, the, uh, uh, Rita, uh, my wife, is sitting over there. So we had a dog, uh, and she was getting, the, uh, 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 she's a bit of a dim bulb, so it was hard to tell that she was in distress. But finally it occurred to us, you know, and so she, uh, Rita uh, took her to the uh, veterinarian because uh, logistics are really beneath me. And uh, she called, and she said, uh, Stella's dying. Stella needs to be put down. She's, she's got a tumor and she's in heart failure and all this panting, you know. Uh, so I, I drive over there. Now, uh, every time one of our kids has gone to school, we've gotten several more dogs. And I, I, it's, it's hard to tell from day to day how many dogs we have, but we got a lot of dogs. And one of the great pleasures in our lives with now with the children gone is that you watch the dogs array themselves in relationship to each other even as they sleep you know they have to be touching each other our oldest Sam is going blind and he hasn't got much more time but he's the boss and even though he can't see anymore periodically he barks to warn the other dogs, say, believe me, I'm on post. Do not try to get away with anything. And everybody's happy. And it is a joy for us beyond even identifying with our species or the fact that it's our blood to roll around with them and, and, and just to watch them and to talk to them. And we anthropomorphize them. You know, we have this bulldog absolutely the ugliest creature I have ever encountered. And, you know, he's got this undivided, and he, and he is so self-possessed and so convinced of his, all of his virtues, you know. The world is his friend, and its proper role is to admire him. So he goes up to every stranger, you know, he waddles up, go ahead, do what you need to do. An expert at cunnilingus. 
which makes him an asset at many parties. <laughs> he even feels it's his right for me to clean the smegma in the folds of fat in his face with a Q-tip. So he says, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. And because I think this is very witty, I take my finger and then I go to my wife. I say, smell this! And that's good for 20 minutes of, <laughs> of hilarity. Um, now, the, the, uh, the predicate of all of that is that uh, we have a sense of our identity, uh, a felt sense of our identity, uh, which transcends our sense of ourselves as separate. That is, when I went to see Stella, uh, before they put her down, I walked into the room, and, and she was in real distress. And she looked at me, and her tail started wagging. Um, and she was happy to see me. And at some level, she knew, well, you know, she knew she was in distress, and I certainly knew she was in distress. And I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. And I knew that the blessing for Stella would be to be held, you know, and I knew I could count on my wife to do it. Uh, well, it is a weakness. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a mere mortal, and sometimes much less than that. But uh, because I think of us as sort of a unity, uh, my wife and I, I, I was comfortable knowing that Stella would be held. And um, that feeling is available to us in our art. In fact, it's the essence of our art, the going out in spirit, the testifying to the going out in spirit by the act of imagination. And if we do anything less than that in our art, then we begin to posit ourselves as victims. Um, the, that sudden on, that outgush of, of joy that, that each of us has experienced at one time or another and probably posited as a mystery and, or a miracle and certainly is transitory, um, is what comes from indwelling with that spirit which understands that our sense of separateness in every fundamental way is an illusion. Now, we recur to our situation, uh, at least as we perceive it. Here we are, the victims, and here they are, the other. Uh, Believe me, that is a distortion. That ain't what's going on. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, should we break or some goddamn thing? What time is it? 10 to 2. Should we break or not? You know what Otis said? You think I'm going to stop now? I ain't going to stop. We're going one time. That's Otis ready. Uh, so here, I'll tell you the story about the most successful writer that I know of. And he started out as a, uh, uh, in terms of trying to get into the walled city. You know, many of us who wound up writers, you know, we started out as something else. You know, I was a mailroom boy or uh, I was whatever the jobs are. What are all the jobs? That's the job, right? Being a mailroom boy, and then I was a gopher, and ba 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 ba. And uh, but ultimately, I'm gonna be a writer, and that that happens sometimes. It happened with this guy, and he became extraordinarily uh, successful. Um, but the first thing he did was send out some signals to the bosses. Smart, 
I'm very smart, and I understand your deepest nature, said he to the bosses, and I will do your bidding. That's a guy with a big upside. Uh, there is no, I understand that you are people of power, position, under a lot of pressure, and the idea of sin, you know, is really for lesser creatures. Wound up doing a murder. And uh, as is the bosses won't, Uh, when they found out about it, well, that's certainly we we had no expectation that that was going to take place. This man is of no use to us because he had sort of taken them at their word. So uh, in fulfilling their expectations, he had made himself outcast. And uh, so he's examining his, his, he's trying to say, well, what the fuck happened there? Because I had a career path laid out. I was inside the walled city. I had gone up from the mail room. I was doing whatever the fuck else I was doing. Some guy, uh, I was sympathizing with some guy. And, uh, uh, and perhaps I was doing more than sympathizing with him. Perhaps I was saying, that son of a bitch, who was the adversary of this person, I said, you realize the threat that he is to you? I mean, let's look at things the way they are. You got it this way. That guy is uh, standing for something else. Ah, he needs killing. You know, it's not a question of doing something. He, he needs killing. Now, so he does the killing. Uh, and then, of course, his boss says, uh, well, we're people of conviction, but we do mistrust fanatics. Gone. So now he's, uh, he leaves town. And... Uh, He's thinking, what the fuck happened? Uh, I, I guess they gave him a pretext. You know, they said, listen, you should leave town. It will be a great career move. I said, leave town till it cools out, and we will bring you back. Because these guys, uh, you know, it wasn't as if that type of thing was foreign to them. Listen, when I moved into Paramount, uh, they're showing me around to my offices. So they say, now this is Bing Crosby's, your office is Bing's old office. Jerry Lewis came after Bing left. He's the one who put in the viewers as if we're underwater in an ocean cruiser. I said, Jesus Christ. Down the road is, how, uh, down the hallway there is Howard Koch, and across the way is Bob Evans. I said, geez, Bob Evans. Uh, when was the last movie he made? And the person showed me around and said, well, uh, Bob doesn't make movies anymore, but he sure knows how to keep a secret. I said, say no more. Uh, some secrets you don't want to know. Um, anyway, they send this guy out. They say, you know, you should probably operate someplace else for a while. Consider yourself still in our employment, but we oughtn't to be in touch for a while. So this guy's on his way to Damascus, and he hears a voice. And the voice says, Paul, why do you persecute me? Now his name is Saul. But if he's hearing a voice, he's not going to make him a liar for one consonant. He says, uh, I didn't know I was. He says, well, 
uh, you argued from uh, the uh, what professed to be revelations that um, if I was the Messiah, it must be the end of days. And if it isn't the end of days, I must not be the Messiah. And therefore, all the people in, in, in the walled city there, you know, uh, need protection from this apostasy. And so you killed the first of the apostles. You killed uh, Stephen. Paul killed Stephen. And now Paul is saying, oh, this is serious. For one thing, I'm hearing voices. I have not heard voices before. Did anybody uh, ever heard of Julian Jaynes? Uh, he says, uh, the, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Are you telling me you don't remember that title? His argument is that the idea of God, uh, that, that, that there, you know, there's two, two lobes, and that the corpus callosum, which maintains circulation between the two lobes, used to be obstructed until very recently. And therefore, we used to hear two voices. And the one voice w uh, was us, and the other voice must have been God, because we didn't know where the fuck the voice was coming from. Uh, now, Paul was a temporal lobe epileptic, you know, and, uh, and it's demonstrated that people with temporal lobe epilepsy are prone to religious visions when they have seizures. So he heard this voice. Now, Paul was a guy who wanted to come into the walled city, and the people at the temple there had a great fucking hustle. The priests, you know, they said is, look, think of them as, uh, think of them as uh, MGM, or think of them as 20th Century Fox, the priests inside the walled city, right? They said, now listen, there are certain rituals which must be performed every day or you are not of the elect. You have to be circumcised, big, you can't eat pork, you have to uh, observe the Sabbath, and if you do that stuff, you are of the elect. And you also have to give us uh, most of your money. That's how you'll know you're saved. But we're going to let you keep some of it, and plus you're going to be inside the walled city, which is big. Uh, you know, outside the walled city is raw sewage. Inside is incense and myrrh and power and every other fucking thing. Now, Paul was from, you know, uh, some, one of the province towns. It happened to be a province in, that the Romans had under their control. But he had this ambivalent idea of order. He wanted to be of it but he also had a tremendous antagonism toward it. And uh, to such an extent that he was a profound believer who was also capable of violence. And in the act of purging himself, whatever, you know, uh, uh, William James said that uh, the only time we are capable of receiving faith is when we experience ego deflation at depth. Uh, for me, you know, I was uh, putting someone in the ground in Mexico. For Paul, I think it was whacking St. Stephen. Uh, maybe he'd heard voices before. It probably wasn't his first seizure, but it was the first time he paid any attention. Now, what the voice said to him is, this sense of structure and order as coercive and special and as the repository only of the priests in the temple is a jerk-off. 
They're just earning in there. And what are other versions of that? Well, the writer is persuaded. Uh, you're weak. You're a child, let's be frank. And I love children. Believe me, I love children. Let me do the adult stuff. You be your nutsy, crazy, childish self. We'll give you some money. We will let you feel whole. We will let you feel as if you were within the walled city. You're not coming, you know, you're not coming right up to the altar because that's a whole different thing. I can't even explain that to you because you're a child. But it's going to be warm in here. No more raw sewage out there and no more of that aching sense of apartness that you've carried even before you started to write. So Paul asked his voice, well, uh, not for nothing, here I am on a mule on the way to Damascus. What am I supposed to do? He says, not works, but faith. Act in faith. I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly what he says. Because what happened was he became a writer, Paul. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds and yourself as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, uh, that's the spirit. That's the spirit that uh, Paul is talking about. Uh, and the spirit is what moves in us when we allow ourselves the act of imagination without conceiving a goal or a purpose which will further us. We have the blessed relief from the sense of self. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man shall say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestations of the Spirit but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether be we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. The body is not, we are not separate from each other. If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Which is to say, even if we believe we're separate from each other, are we separate? 
or are we just indwelling with a temporary misperception? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. Now, that's the guy who did murder. who received the Spirit. Uh, and some can say, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was an accident of circulation through the corpus callosum, maybe. But if we are not saved by works, our faith is tested by the works we do. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to propose something here, uh, which is that our membership in the one body of the Spirit uh, be testified to, um, the, it, you know, uh, equals MC squared. What the fuck does that mean? Well, if you understand what it means, it is the most enormous liberation of energy that we have yet been able to conceive of. If you understand the meaning of the symbol, and only the one little kraut there did to begin with, uh, but the capacity to abstract and to symbolize as a representation uh, uh, of truth, um, we've now been given uh, the uh, internet, um, which is a manner of delivery uh, which minimizes the ability of those we would perceive as the superego, as the sources of order to mystify the process. If, if those, uh, if, if the ATMPG, whatever the fuck their initials are, say, well, listen, your children, you don't understand <laughs> what goes on inside the main room. And we don't want to burden you because you have this other nutsy, crazy gift that we love so much that you tell the stories and they're cute. Now, we have to make them endlessly replicable because you don't know how to do that because you can't even show up for a dentist appointment. <laughs> but you have this nutsy craziness and so you let us be the bosses. Live in fear of us. You're allowed to resent us. You can go home and say to the bride, these cocksuckers. But push comes to shove, it's what you need. It's what you enjoy. Because you're never going to be other than a child, are you? Because we yelled at you at the dinner table. I have a voice, uh, just, just so that you know, just so you know that this is not self-indulgent. I have an ordering voice which is working when I'm sleeping. And when I wake up, hey, oh, he wakes. He wakes. What's he going to, oh, <laughs> that's his idea of urinating. <laughs> With a split stream. <laughs> what, oh, is that, that's how he thinks coffee is supposed to be made. Look, that's how he thinks the ignition of the car should be turned on. By the time I'm, my, I'm on my way to work, how about I want to shoot up? But if I act in faith, if, if, if I have trained myself in such a way to say, works do not save me, but by my works I show my faith, let me, let me, now, uh, because I'm so obsessive, and here I'm extolling the internet, 
I want you to know I don't know how to turn on a computer. I don't know how to turn on a computer. I don't know how to turn on a phone. I don't wear a watch because I break them. My poor wife understands. We have a drawer in our kitchen where are about 75 broken phones because I will let the phone ring. I will never answer a phone, but I will let the phone ring twice, and if it rings more than twice, bang, I break it. Now, I'm also the guy, you know, that uses weapons. So I know I have such ambivalence towards order of any kind. I just got to stay away from it. So I dictate. I know if I try to do an outline, if I, if I separate my works from my faith to that extent, I say, you know what? Let's do an outline and let me just get under a bridge with some dope and a fifth of vodka and I'll be right back. So I don't do no outlines. I let faith govern my works. Now, I do know that because my kids show me all of this stuff, you know, that there are portals or overtures or whatever the fuck it is where you don't need nobody's permission anymore. Uh, you know, that thing where, where the wizard says, hey, ignore the man behind the curtain. The little dwarf, you know, I am Oz the Great and Terrible. And then, you know, it's just another little Jew back there. Uh, and I say that with tremendous, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Jew. I'm a very observant Jew. Uh, this is how I know it's not a punishing God, that I've not just been struck by lightning. So, um, if, if you want to tell your stories in such a way that, that if you accept that you are free and that the organization of your stories should testify to the spirit expressing itself in works. Because whether or not we want it, that's what our stories do anyway. If they don't testify to it in a way which is accessible, that's why Paul talks about the difference between echolalia, is that what speaking in tongues? Is that what echolalia is? Well, this is a low rent crowd. Uh, well, he says, some, to some the gift is speaking in tongues. To others, it is prophecy. Now, but we are prophets. Speaking in tongues, you don't understand. That's a private kind of process. To prophecy is to tell stories. And in the, you know, uh, and unless you think that this is, that I'm some kind of religious fanatic, you know, a professor is a teacher. Um, what, what I want to do is I'm going to give I, I got a whole bunch of, of series ideas. And I, I want to set up a college. Uh, I have several names in mind. Uh, the Writers College or Big Wave Dave University. <laughs> and, but I think it's going to be the Writers College. And uh, and I'm going to endow it. And I'm going to give it a whole bunch of very good series ideas. And anybody who wants to work on them, uh, I will work with in classes, which will be filmed, so that everyone who wants to watch on how the, the overture portal or whatever the fuck it is, will also be a part of this community. 
and uh, will be vested in ownership. And um, don't worry about how it's going to work. The uh, Lao Tzu said, when the Tao is lost, then men begin to speak of good and evil. Everybody's going to have a different fucking plan. Well, what's the percentage? Shakespeare and Lear said, thy life is a gift. This is a gift. And you are vested in this gift as a gesture of faith. The work is the, the giving of this gift. And um, God bless the negotiators on both sides. And, uh, you know, we're going to find out whose virile member ultimately is bigger. And then we'll settle. Uh, but in the meantime, you are not disempowered, and you are not disenfranchised. And my sole stipulation is that you too must become teachers. You must give the way that you vest yourselves in ownership is through volunteering. Uh, you know, the wonderful writer uh, Cubby Selby, uh, who was it? pretty good drunk himself, and uh, uh, his old man used to try and murder him three or four times a week. He'd put him in the oven, he'd try and boil him to death, you know, he'd go after him with a knife. Now, Covey had this kind of an ambivalent uh, attitude towards order himself, you know. He started to drink when he was, uh, whatever, eight, nine years old. Joins the Merchant Marine, he gets tuberculosis, uh, he's put in the hospital when he's 17, loses all but a quarter of one of his ribs. He's in the hospital for three and a half years. Nobody ever came to see him, not one. Did you ever read Last Exit to Brooklyn? He wrote that. Hubert Selby wrote that. Kind of a dark piece of work, surprisingly enough. Anyways, uh, so he gets married, they have a kid, you know, he beats his wife senseless three or four times a week, strangely enough. And uh, she winds up, uh, she says, you know, you're going to murder me. You're going to murder me. So I'm going to leave. But I'm going to leave Billy with you because I know you won't kill him. And if I take him, you'll kill yourself. So she splits. And he's left with the kid, and he gets, he stops drinking. But by his own account, you know, he's not sober particularly because he's filled with rage. And he's, and uh, so he's talking to his sponsor in AA. He says, you know, I think uh, the sponsor says, I think uh, you have an amends to make to your father. So Cubby says, uh, I have an amends to make the, the guy that boiled me, you know, three or four times a week? And he said, well, uh, you seem to be, you seem to not be at peace here. Uh, so Cubby, hey, fuck you, or words to that effect, he says to his sponsor. Now, he didn't have 10 cents. He didn't have 10 cents. And Christmas is coming. And uh, so he takes his kid to a shelter and for Christmas Eve. And they serve food. They, you know, they serve soup and stuff to the mendicants. And uh, Cubby says, it was like a light was coming off my boy. And all of the people that he was serving, they just, they glow, they basked in his radiance. And I went back, he, he borrowed a dime. He called his old man, and he says, how you doing, uh, Dad? 
And uh, he says, well, I'm dying. And uh, Cubby says, well, what can, I, what can I do? He says, uh, well, you can pray for me. So he goes back to his sponsor. He says, well, what the fuck was that about? What's the amends that I had to make to him? He said, well, you, the amends you had to make was to be the son who showed his father the cruelty that a human is capable of. And in forgiving him, you came to forgive yourself. So now his old man starts to come to him in dreams. And he, and he, tells, him, he tells him how to help Billy. Billy's a doctor now, uh, his boy. And they're talking and stuff, and, and uh, Cubby finally says, you know, we could, uh, we, ne we could never ever talk. All you tried to do when you were alive was kill me. And, and now, you know, he says, well, uh, I'm sober now. But I can't stay sober unless you do. And his spirit, the spirit was telling Cubby that his father was alive in imagination. But he couldn't live unless Cubby showed his faith in works. Now that's the burden that each of us carries as an artist. Um, and Part of prophecy is teaching. Uh, and what will heal you, even when you aren't working, and, and, and trust me on this one thing, when you aren't writing, don't trust a goddamn thing that you think about your identity as a writer, because it is the work which generates and purifies faith. So when you're not working, your, separate, your sense of yourself as separate will, will start to, you'll start to indwell with resentment and doubt and misgiving and you'll start to engage in magical thinking. You know, I, if I, that's what I used to do. I used to write the same 12 pages word for word every day for a long time thinking that well if I do it uh, uh, on the 12 times 12 multiple I will be free I'll be able to change a word that's magical thinking which is epiphenomenal you know or whatever obsessive Our wiring gets a little fucked up you know but faith fixes wiring. And um, so we are going to, all of us, stay, we will stay in touch with each other. I'm going to, tomorrow we'll talk about certain writing exercises that are available to you every day, whether you have a contract or a project or whatever we need so that when we're sitting in Starbucks, you know, thinking, well, I guess they don't know who I am, but I think they're getting a sense of it. Um, you can give all that shit up. Okay, so we'll get back together at 1 o'clock tomorrow.